In this video, I'd like to talk a little bit about theory in general. What is a theory? And what does it mean to have a theory about something? A theory is a simplified way of representing the world. It's like a picture or a map. It helps us understand how not buildings are related or not countries are related to one another, like a physical map, but how concepts relate to one another. Like maps, theories are a simplification of a more complex underlying reality. So a world map doesn't have every single detail on it. Neither does a city map, for that matter, have every single detail on it. They try, they try to pick out some of the things that the people who use the map will find useful or important. And I think the same is going to be true for political theories. Theories in that sense are rarely literally true, but they're sometimes helpful helpful for human understanding um, or helpful to orient ourselves to help us try to figure out where we're going. But for all of that, they're still representations. They don't tell you everything. Uh, they tell you often just enough so that you can see how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. But again, they try not to do everything. And if you tried to put everything in a theory, uh, it wouldn't end up being very helpful. OK. All of that was very abstract, but let's look at an example. How is freedom related to democracy? To answer a question like this, we have to start with definitions. Uh, definitions of what freedom is and definitions of what democracy is. And if you're not sure, don't worry. Uh, we have uh, a couple weeks in the class where we'll be talking about both of these concepts. But it's worth noting these definitions are contested. So we're only going to get so far by just looking at the definitions. Now. The concepts do have a logical relationship to one another based on which definitions we choose. They're also going to have an empirical relationship uh, based on what people experience in the world and based on uh, how these things uh, end up interacting. Let's look at, let's look at logical relationships uh, first. So by definition, a democracy has to protect at least some freedoms. Again, people disagree about how many. But at least if it doesn't protect some key uh, democratic freedoms, uh, then it's just not a democ democracy. So uh, the freedom to vote, the freedom to assemble, the freedom to speak about politics especially, right? If, if a, a system doesn't do any of that, then it's probably not a democracy. But what about the reverse? Does a commitment to individual freedom logically commit someone to uh, a commitment to democracy? Not necessarily. It seems entirely possible for a dictatorship to allow its citizens a wide range of freedoms. Uh, the one that it's not going to allow, of course, is the right to vote or participate meaningfully uh, in government, because that's the definition of a dictatorship, is that uh, a relatively small number of people make decisions. On the other hand, those decisions might be to allow the people many freedoms or very few freedoms. At least logically, we can imagine a benevolent dictatorship, and we can probably find at least a few examples of benevolent dictatorships and oligarchies if we look in history. Empirical relationships are something else entirely. Logical relations involve relationships of absolute conceptual necessity. So for example, if I say that a bachelor is an unmarried man, that's a logical necessity. That, that's part of the definition. Political scientists, though, like to look at other kinds of relations than just definitional ones. Uh, in particular, we look at causal relationships. And causal relations, at least in social science, tend to be probabilistic in nature. Uh, that means that it's not a 100% um, cause and effect relationship. It's just a more likely than not kind of cause and effect relationship. So most of the time, if you see x, then you'll also see y. That's a probabilistic relationship. So for example, democratic countries tend to protect a wider range of freedoms than the, minimally, than the minimum conceptually required in order to be a democracy. So what that means is that democracies, although um, they don't necessarily have to grant you a lot of freedoms, typically do. We can think of uh, democratic systems that don't offer a lot of freedoms. Uh, these are in sort of non-liberal democracies. But for the most part, most democracies end up doing so. Uh, similarly, if we look at dictatorships, dictatorships tend not to just squash the freedoms to participate in political life, but they also tend to squash also 
a whole bunch of other civil rights and liberties as well, even though they don't really have to. And of course, this has to do with the tendencies that we observe in the world, not with any kind of logical necessity. And so our theories need to be aware of both the logical necessities, what's conceptually uh, needed, and uh, the empirical probabilities, that is to say, what's more likely than not. Uh, if we see a democracy, more likely than not, we're going to see fewer freedoms than if we see a dictatorship. And finally, let's talk about normative political theory for a minute. Normative political theory is the kind of theory political theorists develop to generate ideas about how our political world ought to be organized. So, for example, when freedom and democracy come into conflict, as they often do, which should we choose? Now, these kinds of questions of value are often quite difficult. Uh, and they're not difficult because we don't know what's valuable. Uh, they're difficult because they make us uh, make difficult choices when we value two things. Uh, and often we do value both freedom and democracy. But there's times when we're going to have to choose. So, for example, uh, democracy might sometimes require restricting someone's freedom. Uh, so, for instance, in a democracy, I have a right to vote. Uh, I am free to vote, uh, but I'm not free to sell my vote. Uh, we think that there would be something particularly undemocratic if we allowed uh, rich people to buy the votes of poor people and then use those votes to pass policies that favor themselves. Uh, selling one's vote seems to be uh, anti-democratic, but it also seems to be a kind of illiberalism in the sense that it restricts people's freedom. Uh, you might think that it's my vote. I can do whatever I want with it. On the flip side, protecting individual freedom may sometimes require limiting the reach of democratic decision making. And this is more obvious. These are the kinds of problems that often fall under the moniker, the tyranny of the majority. Sometimes we want to avoid uh, having a situation where society uh, and the majority of society uh, makes decisions for individuals. For instance, we could imagine uh, a majority deciding what we all, what everybody has to have for dinner, or what everybody has to wear every day to go to work. Uh, and we think that that would be uh, very illiberal, and we would prefer that democracies not make those choices. And so uh, we want to limit uh, collective self-government to uh, some kind of appropriate public realm, uh, issues of public significance, and by contrast, create a kind of private sphere that is free from most governmental interference. Uh, and so in that sense, that requires limiting the reach of democratic decision making. So. What we need at the end of the day is some kind of theory that helps us uh, deal with these scenarios, uh, a set of principles about how to balance freedom and democracy under these variety of scenarios. And that's exactly what a political theory is. A political theory should help you think about these types of issues in a systematic way and help you decide when uh, the public should get involved, when it shouldn't, uh, when individual freedom should be limited, and when it shouldn't. Uh, that is exactly what we need political theories for. Now, um, there are maps and there are guides. Uh, some kinds of theory are purely conceptual. All they're trying to do is highlight the logical and empirical relations between concepts. These are more like maps. They tell you what the lay of the land is, and the primary tool to create these maps is analysis. And in this class, we're going to be asking you to do some analysis to try and uh, articulate what the relationships are are. Other kinds of theories are more normative. They're more like tourism brochures. They paint attractive portraits of points on the map that you should really want to go to and stay and maybe live in. Uh, and to create these kinds of brochures, you need to engage in moral reasoning. Uh, moral reasoning that will show which particular country or neighborhood on the map is better to visit than another. And so you'll paint all kinds of attractive pictures. And that kind of theory is a kind of normative political theory that tells you that you should live in this kind of political system under these kinds of rules rather than a different set. All right, in conclusion, first, you shouldn't feel intimidated by political theory. In reality, you've been living in a world full of theoretical assumptions all of your life. You've been living uh, in a world where you've been making assumptions about uh, various concepts and the meaning of various terms. That is to say, you've made certain assumptions about what a democracy is, uh, about what freedom is. You've been making assumptions about how the world works. That is to say, you have imp implicit empirical theories about, for example, what happens with no government oversight. Uh, and we have fantastic pieces of popular culture 
uh, like uh, the movie The Purge or the uh, TV television show The Walking Dead, which conceptualizes in some way how the show runners think of the world turning out if governmental systems collapsed. And finally, we have normative theories, views about what kinds of political systems are desirable. And once again, you've all grown up in the United States. Uh, that means you've, you've uh, suffered through quite a bit of pressure uh, and uh, quite a few background assumptions about the value of, say, American democracy uh, and how it's desirable compared to dictatorship. Um, again, these are normative theories that you've been um, enmeshed with your, your entire life. The question now in this class is whether you can, A, articulate these theories clearly, clearly. that is to say, can you uh, specify what the relations between the different concepts involved are? Uh, can you submit them to scrutiny? And finally, can you begin to contribute uh, to conversations, conversations some of which date all the way back to Plato and Socrates 2,500 years ago, about what the best way for human beings to live together in society are?